Very fortunate to have, to have Professor Mohammed Abdallah with us this afternoon. Um, Professor Abdallah AM is going to explore the Islam you don't know. Professor Abdallah is an indigenous Palestinian who has worked in the fields of Islamic studies for over 25 years, playing a leading role in establishing Islamic studies across several Australian universities. He's currently the founding director of the Centre of Islamic Thought and Education at the University of South Australia. And I'd just like to commend to you an article that Professor Abdullah has written for the December issue of Eremos titled The Role of Ethics and Spirituality in Islam. This article explores the profound interconnection, uh, as Professor Abdullah puts it, between ethics and spirituality in Islam and their relevance for the contemporary world. Grounded in revelation, Professor Abdullah states, Islamic ethics emphasizes moral conduct towards both God and creation, while spirituality focuses on the purification of the soul. Professor Abdullah, thank you so much for being here today, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John, for having me. And uh, thank you, Kate, and thanks to everybody who has been gracious to invite me to share with you some, uh, some ideas, some thoughts about my understanding of Islam. And so, therefore, I, I begin by acknowledging the uh, traditional land on which I am sitting, the Ghana land, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, but also, I want to uh, start by thanking you, uh, based on the uh, prophetic teaching uh, that states in Arabic, uh, whosoever does not thank people, does not thank God. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And I hope you can all hear me. So what I will do, I'll just share the slides. And what I'm going to do is speak for about maybe half an hour, so as not to bore you to death. <laughs> so then we'll try to have a conversation. And uh, uh, I'm sure you all have some background about Islam and Muslims. And I hope what I will share with you today is perhaps will add to your existing understanding of Islam, or hopefully may try to clarify certain things about Islam and may introduce certain concepts and ideas that you may have not, you may not be familiar with. In, in any case, it, it gives me pleasure to be able to do so. So I'll just put my slides up and, uh, and so we'll see how we go. All right, I hope you can all see this now. <clears throat> Uh, so, first, uh, it's important to talk about the origin of Islam from an Islamic perspective. Now, uh, before doing so, allow me to say that despite the, I would call the interconnectedness between Islam and indeed Islamic civilization with uh, Christianity, Judaism, and the Western civilizations broadly, and we won't have time to talk about this, but that's one of my areas of specialties where I talk about the interconnectedness of civilizations. I'm happy to answer questions on that. But despite the very solid interconnectedness and the relationship between these two civilizations, the Islamic civilization and the Western civilizations, uh, the misunderstanding about Islam and Muslims uh, is profound in the West. Uh, and uh, this is for a number of reasons. One is historical reasons because of the often repeated uh, discourse about the conflict between Muslims and Christians, uh, specifically the often repeated narrative about uh, the Crusaders and the battle with Islam. Uh, but also in more contemporary times, uh, this misunderstanding and misconceptions and perhaps misrepresentations of Islam and Muslims is due to several factors, one of which is the uh, acts of some Muslims, no doubt, such as acts of terrorism in the name of Islam, but also uh, the political and media rhetoric of the West about Islam and Muslims. And there has been so much research on that 
to show the extent to which Islam has often been misrepresented in politics and media. But that's not my topic, uh, because uh, that's something that uh, people may come across, and I just wanted to make that point. Now, from an Islamic perspectives, perspective, Muslims don't assume that Islam started with Prophet Muhammad in Arabia in the 7th century. And that might come as a surprise to some. Uh, in fact, Muslims believe that Islam is the culmination and perhaps the final, uh, the final brick in the building of uh, the, uh, the teachings of divine revelation that God sent to humanity uh, from the time of Adam onwards. And so uh, what Muslims, and this is what Muslims believe is that Islam, which simply means submission to God, that's what is, the word Islam means. Uh, it can, the word Islam comes also from the root word salam, peace, but also comes from the root word uh, silm, which is submission. And so what Muslims argue, based on the primary teachings of Islam, the Quran, is that Islam, which is submission to God, started with the creation of Adam, uh, and followed by all preceding prophets, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and so forth. And so if one can speak of an Old Testament and a New Testament, then we can speak of the Quran from an Islamic perspective as the final testament. And we don't see these three, those testaments or revelations uh, separate from each other, but rather uh, interconnected uh, and uh, have primarily the same core message. And what you see, of course, here is the Kaaba. This is uh, the uh, house of God. Of course, we don't believe that God resides there. Uh, it is simply saying the house of God, just you, as you would say, a church or a synagogue or a mosque is the house of God. Uh, but what Muslims say is that this is the first uh, house of God that was built on earth uh, uh, in, by Abraham initially and his son, Ishmael, and then continued to uh, be continue to be there. And so once in a lifetime, Muslims, uh, when they are able to do so physically, and otherwise, they perform the Hajj or the pilgrimage. And part of the rituals of the Hajj is to circumvallate or to go around it, and not worshipping this place itself, but this is a place that unites people. And as you know, when Muslims pray, they face this direction anywhere in the world. Now, these are the two primary sources of Islam. And so all things Islamic must come back to the Quran and must come back to the hadith or the, or the sunnah. They are, the word hadith and sunnah are used interchangeably. The Quran is uh, the defined uh, not just simply as the word of God, but it is defined more comprehensively in Islam as the exact word of God, word for word, letter for letter, vowel for vowel, as revealed to the angel Gabriel, who then revealed it to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which then was transmitted uh, word for word, uh, letter for letter, word for word, vowel for vowel, to us today through an unbroken chain of transmission. That's the definition. And when Muslims speak of the Quran, they only speak of the Quran in the Arabic language, the original language in which it was revealed. Anything else other than the Arabic language so it would be the translation of the meaning of the Qur'an. So if you have the English uh, uh, at home, an English copy of the Qur'an, we would not consider that the Qur'an. We would consider that the translation of the meaning of the Qur'an, uh, because the translator, as you can imagine, would be subjective and would be translating the Qur'an according to his or her understanding of the meaning. And that's why to... Uh, to become a scholar of the Quran, one has to master about 10 branches of knowledge, uh, including the classical Arabic with all of its dialects. And that, that's why one of the tragedies of modern world, of the modern world, is people claiming to be specialists 
in the Quran, for example, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, simply by opening a translation of the meaning of the Quran or knowing how to read it in Arabic and assuming now that they are specialists in the Quran. Uh, for example, in addition to a mastery of the Arabic language and its all of its dialects, uh, a specialist of the Quran must also know uh, several branches of knowledge, including something like Asbab al-Nuzul, or the reason for revelation. And so as you're reading the Quran, you come across verses that may be legal in nature, or ethical, moral in nature, or spiritual. And one must understand why was that verse revealed, and when was it revealed, and what was the con context of revelation, so as not to take it out of context. And so when interpreting the Quran, a scholar would look at the text and the context. And I don't want to go too much into details, but this is just a snippet, and I'm happy to talk more about it. But the Quran, as you can imagine, cannot encompass everything that Islam would have, but rather it has the most fundamental uh, uh, aspects of Islam. Uh, but the details are found in the Hadith. Hadith simply means narrative. Uh, and Sunnah means the path of the Prophet. So the Hadith collection is an explanation. It is an expanding of the concepts that are found in the Quran or the teachings. For example, the Quran, throughout the Quran, it says, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish ritual prayers. But the Quran does not tell us the details of how to do that. Because if the Quran was to explain the details of every aspect, then you would need <laughs> a very large book. But the Arabic Quran is more is just about 6,000 plus verses. The other thing I wanted to mention about the Quran is that part of, part of the uh, uh, authentication and the, uh, the verification of the Quran is to having it memorized by heart from cover to cover a practice that was started from the time of the Prophet until our time. And so literally without exaggeration, you'll find millions uh, of people who know the Quran from cover to cover in the Arabic language. So in our mosque here in Adelaide, small Adelaide, one of the mosques, you could easily find up to 10 people who know it by heart. And these are could be ordinary people, you know, they're not necessarily specialists. And the reason is the preservation of the authentic word of God as was revealed to the Prophet. And so the hadith is, uh, the, it goes hand in hand. And so you cannot go and open the Quran and look at a verse and decide to interpret it and, uh, and, and, uh, and interpret it without having to go back to the hadith because it gives you the context. And therefore a scholar of Islam would have to have knowledge of both and uh, mastery of both. A fundamental teaching of Islam is the belief in all the prophets and the messengers of God. So Islam is very inclusive at this level. And this is one verse in the Quran, so chapter 2, verse 136, just to give you an example. And this is the translation of the meaning. Uh, say, here say, the Arabic is Qud. So when God addresses the prophet, he often says to him, say, meaning go and tell people. We believe in God and in what has been sent down to us and what was sent down to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, the tribes of Israel. And what was given to Moses, Jesus, and all the prophets by their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and we, de we devout ourselves to him or we submit ourselves to God. Now, this is a verse that makes it therefore compulsory for every Muslim to believe in these prophets and attribute um, prophethood and messengership to those prophets. And therefore, a Muslim cannot be a Muslim if they don't believe this in this verse. And a Muslim cannot be a Muslim if they, for example, mock or any of these prophets. That's why you'll find a high level of veneration among Muslims for these prophets. Uh, and you'll never find in a Muslim country, for instance, the name Jesus or Moses or Isaac written in a place that is deemed inappropriate or disrespectful, such as a bathroom or anything like this. Now, a key concept of Islam, in fact, the cornerstone of all things Islamic is a concept called Tawheed. Tawheed means the absolute oneness of God. The word for God in Arabic is Allah, 
which you are familiar with, spelt A-L-L-A-H, often pronounced Allah, but actually the proper pronunciation is Allah. So the emphasis is on the L, or the double L, Allah. And Allah is an Arabic word uh, that is, uh, that's uh, interesting because it does not represent pl plurality nor gender. Uh, and one could fall in that difficulty in the, using the English language. If you say God, you can say gods and you can say goddess. And so it may give the impression in the mind of the, uh, of the beholder that God is a male or a female or belonging to a certain uh, gender or uh, ethnicity or color. And uh, Islam is very much against this idea. And so uh, the Quran used the term Allah as the the personal name of God, Allah, the God, which, as I said, in the name, in the mind of a Muslim, be he a child or an adult, the mind of the Muslim, therefore the word Allah can never give the impression of more than one, nor does it give the impression of a gender, and therefore no impression of a color. What color was this God? What gender was this God? And this is captured in one verse in the Quran, one small chapter in the Quran. This chapter is called Al-Ikhlas, or the chapter of sincerity. And this is the translation of that meaning. Uh, in this case, I use the Quran translation by M.A.S. Abdul Hari in 2005, the Quran, a new translation, Oxford University Press. And if I recommend that if you want a Quran translation, then this would be a appropriate and suitable one. Now in this chapter, I, which I will read in Arabic and then give you the translation of the meaning, uh, it sums up the understanding of oneness from an Islamic perspective. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qulhu Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad. In the name of God, the Lord of the Lord of Mercy, the Giver of Mercy, say. He is God the One, God the Eternal, Allah the One, Allah the Eternal. He begot no one, nor was he begotten, and no one is comparable to him, full stop. Now the word him and he does not necessarily refer to gender, because in the Semitic languages, Arabic, Aramaic, Hebrew, uh, he does not necessarily refer to gender when speaking about God. But it is for convenience, for we don't believe that God is a male, nor do we believe that God is a female, which is important because that means automatically we as human beings, men and women, become equal. For if God was to be represented in a male figure, then it may give the indication that um, males are superior to female, and the opposite is true. So Islam is categorical about this, that God is absolutely one with no comparison. Another verse in the Quran says, Laysa shay, there is nothing like God. And so no matter what you try to imagine God to be, it is not. So how do we know Allah? We know Allah through his revelation and through the cosmos that he created. And in, in Islam, uh, the Quran is referred to as God's closed book or God's written book. And the cosmos is known as God's open book or observable book. And to increase one's faith in God, uh, Islam advocates that one contemplates on the verses or the signs of God in his written book, the Quran, and one contemplates and understands God's uh, observable signs in his universe. So both go hand in hand. And that's why in Islamic civilization, uh, uh, there was no conflict between religion and science, uh, proper science and proper religion. Uh, in fact, Muslim scholars throughout the ages saw them complementing each other, and there was no this 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 discord uh, or this rather uh, tension between science and religion. Now, Tawheed is the defining doctrine of Islam. It declares absolute monotheism, the unity and uniqueness of God as creator and sustainer of the universe, the basis of religious knowledge, history, metaphysics, ethics, social, economic, and the world order. And I want to give you just. Some examples here, I'm using art and architecture as an example. Tawheed in art and architecture. Now all authentic Islamic art must reflect divine unity. Islamic art is always centered art, and that is a reflection of Tawheed, oneness. 
And in doing so, it excludes uh, forms of idolatry. Uh, and, if, and an essential aspect of Islamic art is that the Islamic perspective has been summarized in an important hadith that defines Islamic art in the whole of Islamic civilization. This is the hadith, meaning the statement from the Prophet Muhammad, where he said in Arabic, Inna Allah, jamal. Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. Or Allah is beautified and loves beauty. And this is reflected, and I'm sure many of you who have traveled or have seen mosques or traveled to Muslim countries like whether Turkey or Malaysia or whatever, you see Islamic art is quite distinct because it is un-iconic art because it has to represent that oneness of God, means art that refuses to depict the divine in a direct form. It excludes a statue or an image that represents divinity. The reason for it is so the reason for is that the emphasis of Islam upon Tawheed on the highest level. And here are some examples. So you, when we said Islam is a centered art, you can see here in the middle, it always starts in the middle. Islamic art it always starts in the middle, a dot, and then it opens up. As if to say that's the unity, that's the oneness, and from that oneness everything emerges. As if to say everything emerges from the oneness of God. And I'll just quickly share some of these beautiful images. And you can see here geometric patterns too. They replaced Muslim artists, replaced iconism and idols and statues and figures with geometric patterns. And these are highly mathematical geometric patterns. In fact, uh, branches of mathematics were, were invented, as you would know, in order to come up with these beautiful designs. Uh, this is a bathhouse, in fact, in one of the uh, buildings. Uh, in Iran. Again, uh, even in architecture, you see there is a middle point. Here, the middle point is that fountain. Not only does the water represent life, as the Quran says, and we've created life, and uh, uh, we've created every life from water, but also it immediately attracts your attention to the center point, and from that center point, everything emerges, Tawheed. The same thing with calligraphy. You see it here. This is Arabic calligraphy. And the same thing with architecture. The architecture, Islamic architecture in the form of mosques, for example, it has that beauty. God is beautiful and loves, loves beauty without taking away attention from the unity, Tawheed of Allah. Taj Mahal, of course. Inside one of the mosques in Shiraz in Iran, the beauty without uh, taking our, our focus away from Tawheed. The same thing, there's a mosque, I think, in, in Turkey. You see the calligraphy right at the top and replace the and at the bottom. There is two levels there of calligraphy and the windows and the shapes and the light that is coming through all have meanings and symbolic representations of divine oneness and the light of God. This is the Blue Mosque, which you may have visited also in Istanbul. And this is, of course, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which, uh, by the way, is one of the most magnificent pieces of architecture worldwide. Uh, this is, uh, is inside a mosque, also the geometric patterns. You can see the middle, and from that middle, everything emerges. And Alhambra in Spain, similar ideas, a beautiful representation of beauty without having to uh, uh, divulge in iconism and so forth. But also I want to draw to your attention the combination between actually <laughs> Chinese art and, and Arabic calligraphy. And that's interesting because Islam has been in China for the last 1200 years. And one of the oldest mosques in the world is actually in China. And this is a statement by uh, a scholar who specializes in uh, uh, calligraphy. And I, I, he says the Chinese and Arabic calligraphic traditions have often been compared as to the two of the world's finest manifestations of the written word, but never likened. Indeed, they are at once opposites and complete complements. When combined, the result is an artistic piece that is a work of incredibly unique beauty and a testimony to man synthesizing Jesus, uh, genius. Here is an example. So the font is Chinese, but the letters are Arabic. 
So the, in Arabic, it says, Tawakkaltu ala Allah. I rely on Allah. And on the, on, 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 on the left there, the Chinese, the, the meaning of it. This is from a renowned Chinese Muslim calligrapher. His name is Haji Noor Din, which I, 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 I give some references. I'm happy to share these slides with all of you. Right? And here's another example. This is the word Allah in Arabic with Chinese fonts. And you can see this synthesizing genius. And if we have time, we can talk about Islam's attitude towards cultures uh, in the sense that Islam never saw cultures as negative or as an adversary, but culture is good and neutral. Islam is neutral at the cultural level and the Muslim scholars and jurists de developed a principle in Islamic law, al-Ada muhakkama, culture is authoritative, uh, meaning when you go into a nation or a country, you don't destroy the indigenous cultures because you appropriate or incorporate the indigenous cultures into your Islamic identity. And in doing so, uh, and largely speaking, Islamic civilization was very successful in maintaining indigenous cultures and enhancing them and not destroying them, as in the case of colonial, colonization, for instance. Uh, the, you come across, of course, Sharia, and I just briefly want to talk about it because of the confusion about Sharia. Often the word Sharia is try and translated as Islamic law, and that is not entirely correct. So Muslims, when they speak about Sharia, Sharia means the, the path towards a watering well, so the path towards a well. And the symbolism here is that if you follow the path of God, divine revelation, then it shall lead you to salvation. Uh, but And Sharia is more comprehensive than just law. Muslims see Sharia to refer to the commands, prohibitions, guidance, principles, and laws. So it covers law, ethics, morals, spirituality, and so forth. But what, what I wanted to focus on when we speak about Sharia, which most people are unaware of, actually, including Muslims who are not educated in Islamic law or Sharia, is the higher objectives. To make it easy for you, if I was, I want to, if I was to summarize the entire purpose of Sharia, and this summary is not my summary, but the summary of classical leading Muslim scholars, and this has become a standard discourse among Muslim scholars when they speak about, well, what is the intent and purpose behind Sharia? In other words, well, why would God give us guidelines, ethical, moral, legal guidelines? What is the purpose behind that? Especially if, as Islam would argue, God is not benefited by acts of obedience, nor is God harmed by acts of disobedience. The maxim in Arabic or Islamic discourse, acts of obedience don't benefit God, and acts of disobedience don't harm God. Why? Because God is absolutely independent. Self-subsisting is not in need of anything. Then the question that begs itself, then why does he ask us to do certain things and not other things? And the answer to this question is summarized in what Muslim scholars call the higher objectives of Sharia. And they come, the, they, they are summarized into five higher objectives. You can add to those objectives, but these are the five principal objectives for all things Islamic. Number one, protection of religion. So the one of the higher objectives of Islam and the reason and the rationale and behind do certain things and don't do certain things is not for the sake of doing it and not doing it. Not because God had nothing else to do and decided to do that. But there is a deeper reasoning behind it. Number one, protection of faith or religion. Number two, protection of life. Number three, protection of intellect. Number four, protection of lineage. And number five, protection of property. I'll give you an example. Islam categorically is against the consumption of anything that intoxicates. So intoxications, including drugs and anything that befogs the mind or makes man or human lose their faculty of reasoning, Islam categorically says it is absolutely prohibited. 
somebody might say, what if it's consumed in small quantities where it does not lead to intoxication or the befogging of the mind? And the response to that comes from the hadith where the prophet says, that which is prohibited in large quantities is prohibited in small quantities. And that is because Islam adopts the philosophy of prevention is better than cure. And so if you look at intoxication only, why would Islam prohibit intoxication? Then you can see how this framework, how this, this, the, the question to why the prohibition of intoxication is answered by this framework. Because the prohibition of intoxication and drugs is so that it protects your faith, your life, protects your intellect, it will protect your lineage, and it will protect your property. Right? So even when it comes to prohibition, so as you know, Muslims are not allowed to consume pork or pork products. And that is that the reason for that is not because pig in itself is, is evil. <laughs> it's not. It's a creation of God that has to be loved like any other creation. But it's to do with that issue of life, and issue of, of hygiene, the preservation of life. Because preservation of life in Islam does not simply mean the protection of life from, from murder or manslaughter, but the protection of life in the sense of knowing what you consume because your body and your life is a sacred trust. And therefore what we eat is important. And, and therefore this is an important framework uh, in Islamic, in, in Sharia. So the entire purpose for Sharia from an Islamic perspective or guidelines or divine law or divine ethics and morals is not because God wants to make life difficult for us, but we say it is to facilitate our lives so that we live wholesome lives. And that includes the protection of religion, protection of life, protection of intellect. If you take protection of life, for example, the killing of innocent lives is absolutely prohibited according to all interpretations of Islam under all circumstances, right? And the, the definition of, uh, the, 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 the prohibition of the killing of innocent lives and the definition of innocent life in Sharia is any non-combatant non bystander, regardless of their faith or gender or their religious ideology or political ideology. If they are innocent from the Sharia perspective, then their killing is completely prohibited. And this is why terrorism in the name of Islam is highly problematic and very unethical. And we can discuss that later if you want. Uh, I'm just aware of time. So now another issue to do with Sharia, if we talk about Sharia in terms of the legal, ethical, moral, there is more to Islam than that. So the legal, ethical, moral, you can think of it as the exotoric, the external, the outward aspect of Islam. But a very important aspect of Islam is the, uh, the inward or the esoteric or the spiritual, often uh, known as Sufism or Tasawwuf. Uh, but Tasawwuf or Sufism uh, is on a spectrum. You know, it can be some forms of Sufism from a traditional Islamic perspective can be quite pro highly problematic. And some other Sufism can be also, it can be on either extreme, and the Sufism that mainstream Islam would accept is the middle, moderate type of spirituality that is consistent with the dictates and the teachings of the Sharia. But a, a very important aspect of Islam, which often goes unnoticed or unspoken about, is the purification of the self. In other words, if a person wants to follow all the external observances of Islam, praise five times, pass in the month of Ramadan, they give charity. But they have neglected to purify themselves from inside, purify their heart from backbiting and envy and hatred and malice and jealousy. Then there is a serious problem with, a, with this person's practice of Islam, right? Uh, just to give you an example, we fast in the month of Ramadan from dawn to dusk for a whole month. Starting from dawn to dusk, no eating, no drinking. And then at sunset, we break fast. So if God doesn't benefit from our acts of obedience, then why does he ask us to fast? 
and then some people may explain it to in terms of physical well-being. But what Islam, when Islam looks at it in terms of spiritual well-being, and in this case, the Prophet, for example, said in the Hadith, uh, whosoever does not control their tongue from backbiting and slander whilst fasting, God has no need for their fast. <laughs> right? So, and so the, the rationale behind fasting is not just to train the stomach to abstain from eating and drinking and to bring a level of discipline, but also to abstain the rest of the body from engaging and indulging in things that may be highly problematic, such as backbiting and slandering and the like. Uh, take, for example, envy. Envy is an internal uh, aspect of the human being. And uh, Islam, just like other faith traditions, looked at those uh, spiritual diseases and said, unless you purify yourself from these spiritual diseases, uh, you are high, highly likely to be in, pro in, in, in serious problem, not only in this world, but the next world. And so envy, for example, Islam looks at envy and says, envy consumes good deeds like fire consumes dry grass. Envy. And so envy uh, or blameworthy envy, uh, in certain instances, praiseworthy envy, they can be praiseworthy envy, no time to talk about that. But envy has to be cleansed. Hatred from the heart has to be cleansed. And in fact, if a, 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 any study of the Quran would find that there's a massive emphasis of the Quran. In one of those chapters of the Quran titled Ashams or the Sun, uh, Allah takes 11 consecutive oaths. And uh, in the Quran, when God takes an oath, it means he's giving us an important news, meaning pay attention. So he takes 11 consecutive oaths and then he says قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Successful is he or she who purifies them, their soul and, uh, and uh, uh, unsuccessful is the one who does not purify their soul. So the purification of the self or the soul is a science in Islam that is highly valued and much has been written about it and I'm happy to discuss it as we go. Uh, finally, uh, Islamic ethics is characterized by a number of distinguishing aspects. The ultimate source of, of Islamic ethics is divine. It relates to all aspects of individual and communal life. So in Islam, there is no thing, the idea that religion is privatized is highly problematic for its Muslims. It's, a religion is never privatized. You practice your faith in the private sphere and in the public sphere. Of course, in the public sphere without imposing it on others you individually must practice the ethics of Islam privately and publicly. Islamic ethics, in Islamic ethics, the ends do not justify the means, and Islamic ethics must be governed by wasatiya and i'tidal, or moderation and balance, the direct opposite of extremism and injustice. I'm going to stop here, but uh, this is further reading, which will be there in the slides, uh, if you would like to uh, read further. But I think I have spoken enough and I'm going to stop sharing and then open the floor for your comments, questions, uh, and so forth. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. The what we would like to do is maybe take a few minutes for any clarifying questions that people might have before we move into breakout rooms? There may be something that Professor spoke about that is just, I just need to get a bit clearer in my mind what he's speaking, what, what he means by that. And um, so we just take about five or 10 minutes just to see if there's any questions that are kind of burning. And also please use the chat if you would like to um, to put your question in or, or comments and we'll just see how we go with that. But I do want to give people a chance to share a little bit with each other too before we finish up this afternoon. So if you wanna put your cameras back on, I, oh, we're still recording, aren't we? Yes, we're still recording. Um, that's okay. What? If you want to keep your camera off, it's up to you. But if you do want to speak, then probably be a good idea to put your 
camera on so we can see you. Would anybody like to ask any questions? There was a lot in there, wasn't there? So maybe there's something just like, could you say something more about this or would like to understand this a bit better? I was uh, moved by the Islamic art. That was very interesting. I never knew about that. Yeah. That it was how much uh, uh, depicting the oneness of God. Mm. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. I have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Celia. How do people treat the people um, in the mosque who memorized the whole Quran in Arabic? Like, what sort of way are they present in the world? <laughs> Thank you for that question. It's a nice question. I've mean, never been asked that question before. <laughs> so, so, uh, they treat them obviously with respect. Uh, and what happens usually, they would uh, always uh, give them the first uh, preference to lead the prayer. And so, uh, because when we, especially in the prayer uh, where the Quran needs to be read uh, uh, audibly, and that's three, three, three of the five prayers, uh, the Quran is read audibly. And so uh, if we, I was to go to the mosque and the official imam of the mosque is not there, then typically they would look for one of these people who had memorized the Quran or knows most of the Quran by heart, and they would ask them to lead the prayer. And this person may be a 15 year old young man, right, or younger, because, uh, and out of that respect, they'd ask him to lead the prayer. Uh, so so that's, the, that's one way of showing uh, respect. Uh, also, in the month of Ramadan, part of, the, uh, part of the practice and tradition of Islam in terms of uh, preserving the authenticity of the original Quran almost in almost every mosque in the world, not all, almost all, the entire Quran is read from cover to cover throughout the month. So every night in the night vigil, and the mosque mosque is usually full in Ramadan, and the Imam or Imams start with a certain portion beginning from the first chapter. And the first night they may read if you know about 50 verses, and the second night 50, etc until by the end of Ramadan, they had read the whole Quran to the whole community. And they will be those people who had memorized the Quran usually stand directly behind the Imam so that if he was to make a mistake, and usually he may, I mean, some of them are brilliant. They read the whole Quran from cover to cover without a single mistake. And by the way, they're not holding the Quran like this. They're actually reading it from memory. Ooh. But if they were to make a mistake, the persons behind them who also know the Quran must correct him. It's not a choice <clears throat> because the Imam has no right to add or delete to the words of the Quran that he is reading. And this has been a tradition in Islam for the last 1400 years in order to make sure that the original Quran is preserved and no additions or deletions have come into it. And so even if the person behind the imam happens to be 30 years younger than the imam and he hears that the imam had missed a word or misread a word or forgot a word, then he would immediately correct him. And so the imam would pause and reread that verse again. Right? So that's the type of respect they are shown. Okay. I see Elizabeth has her hand up. Thank you. Amazing information. Thank you very much indeed. Most, most interesting. The question I have, well, there's a comment. What incredible self-determination to be able to lead such a, a pure and holy life according to um, your Quran. Um, do you have 
anybody that helps and guides you, either God himself or other people in the community that help people stay on the path? Yes, I, thank you for that question. Absolutely. Uh, we can never stay on the path by ourselves. We always need people around us. And of course, the ultimate source of guidance is God himself. And so we always seek his guidance, first and foremost. And we must believe wholeheartedly that none can guide but God and can, and therefore, uh, in every prayer, uh, a part of the, the first chapter of the Quran includes towards the end, guide us to the straight path. And this is read uh, uh, 15 times at least every day. Uh, so number one is the knowing to the, the, the absolute belief that it is ultimately guide, uh, God who guides. And so we must ask him all, always for guidance. But to stay on the uh, ethical, moral path, we need a community around us. And that's why many writers, Muslim and otherwise, have said that even if you are a, a godly, godly person, who, who wants to uphold ethical and moral standards, but happen to be in a society that is predominantly the opposite, then it is quite likely that you will be influenced. And so we need to have people around us. And those people include, of course, family members, but also the imam and the teachers who might be found at, this, at the mosque or the schools. And the imams play, as you can imagine, more than just the role, the role of more than just leading the prayer. They are counselors. They give uh, support uh, almost at any time of the day or night. <laughs> they call the pawn. Uh, and also, uh, we have in every mosque, we have uh, community congregations where a person can go to that uh, group of people. Uh, we have regular classes, we have regular reminders in the mosque uh, to help people along the path. Uh, the jama'ah, the Arabic word is, is congregation. And there is a beautiful, remind me of a beautiful hadith that says that, uh, that uh, Satan devours a lonely worshiper, just like a wolf devours a lonely sheep, right? And so one has to have that level, the congregation and people around him or her uh, for that support, definitely. Christine, you have your hand up. Um, you, you're muted. Yes. <laughs> uh, this might seem a bit of a trivial question, but I'm a chaplain at a university and a group of Muslim uh, male students became a little bit vehement about women's dress. And so I was wondering where are the requirements for women's dress? Is it more in the Quran or more in the supplementary text? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Both. So the, the uh, instruction for modesty mm. in the Quran and Hadith is both for men and women, by the way. Uh, sadly, in some Muslim cultures and some Muslim uh, Muslims may interpret it to mean for women only, and that is mm. not that's not right. Uh, the verses in the Quran speak about uh, modesty for both men and women, <clears throat> and the lower, lowering of some of the gaze for both men and women, <clears throat> and the the very direct uh, verses of the Quran, uh, <laughs> say to the believing men to lower some of their gaze. And say to the believing women to lower some of their gaze. But also the idea of modesty is both for both men and women. Uh, in, in the case of women's modesty, which includes the covering of the body, excluding the face and the hands, uh, is found in the Quran and in the Hadith, so both. And there is a third, uh, there is a thought, a third source. So you've got, you've got the Quran as the primary source, the Hadith as the secondary source, and then you've got the third source, and that's called the Ijma, consensus of the scholarly community. <clears throat> now, consensus of the scholarly community is derived from both the Quran and the Hadith. 
And as you can imagine, consensus is very difficult to arrive at in any given circumstance. And therefore, the only time you might find consensus in the Islamic discourse is on, the, on issues that are absolutely fundamental and are explicitly stated in the Quran. And you'll find, therefore, uh, consensus on that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that is where the source of modesty and uh, women's modesty and men, men's over are found in the Quran and the Hadith and the consensus of the scholarly community. Great, good. Thank you very much. Um, Jacqueline has a question and comment in the chat. Jacqueline, do you want to unmute and speak to that or would you like me to read it? Okay, you're not unmuting, so I think I will just read it. Um, Jacqueline says, thank you for your insightful discussion on the teachings of Islam. I'm truly pleased to hear about the concept of Tawheed, where God is understood as equal and beyond gender, and the harmonious relationship between science and religion. I've always been fascinated by the role of music and prayer in Islamic worship, particularly the way it is often recited publicly over speakers, which creates a powerful shared spiritual experience. I'm curious about whether these practices are meant to be preserved strictly due to Islamic tradition, or if there's room for evolving the way worship is expressed. Yeah, thank you, excellent question. Uh, of course, here you're referring to music, two types, uh, one type of music in inverted commas, uh, where you hear from the speakers, and that is the call for prayer, the adhan, which, uh, of course, you won't hear it in Australia because you're not allowed to uh, uh, use the loudspeakers publicly. Inside the mosque, you will hear it. But if you go, and many, some of you may have been to Muslim countries where you hear that call of prayer, and I'm, I'm assuming this is what you're referring to, but I want to talk about the other aspect of music also. So if you're referring to this aspect of quote-unquote music, whether it's the chant or the, for the call of prayer, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you know, uh, then uh, the words here do not change, are not evolving. The words do not evolve here because the words have meanings and these meanings were derived from the hadith. Uh, what I want to, uh, something I didn't mention uh, Muslim scholars say Islam is evidence-based in the sense that you cannot come up with anything or an opinion about Islam to say this is Islamic or non-Islamic without evidence. And the evidence has to be from the primary sources. And so the adhan or the call play of prayer is, was, or was taught by the Prophet at his time. And so the words remain. And the words Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. Uh, I bear witness that there is no God but God, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God, come to prayer, come to success, and so on. The way it is sung varies. The way it is chanted varies. And that in itself has become an art. In fact, uh, what may not be common knowledge to most people is that uh, uh, Islamic civilization invested heavily in writing about music and the, the science of music. Right, and influence, in fact, uh, the science of music, especially in Spain, when they were in Spain for 800 years. Uh, one of the books called Kitab al Musiq al Kabir, the, 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 the large book of music, <laughs> right, <laughs> that talks about the, the art of music. Now, this is one on one hand. But if we talk, talk about music generally, then Islam uh, and Muslim scholars don't have a problem with music and lyrics per se provided that music and those lyrics do not go against the fundamental teachings of the faith. So for example, a lot of sadly, uh, uh, the, so the very new age type of <laughs> music and lyrics that involves perhaps vulgarity, uh, uh, open sexuality, or the call for say disobedience, or the call for rebellion against parents or whatever, then categorically all Muslim scholars would tell you that is not allowed. So the problem is not with music per se, but the issue becomes 
the in the 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 format and the content and the application of that music. And if it it does go against the fundamental teachings of the oneness of God and the idea of beauty and the idea of goodness and the idea of preservation of life, etc., then Muslim scholars will tell you we have a problem with that, right? Because any practice must have a meaning. And uh, uh, when when sacredness was taken out, and this is, by the way, a very modern phenomenon that was the consequence of sec secularism. When sacredness was taken out of any art or any science or any, any expression, often it made it very ugly, <laughs> so, right? It gave it that ugliness. I, I just want to give you a quick example. It might make sense. If you look at the Eastern traditions when it comes to martial arts, you know, what comes to your mind now is the Kung Fu masters in the hills of China, right? That martial arts had a meaning. And the meaning was often interrelated with sacredness. And it, meant, it was meant to enhance this human being. Then this martial arts was taken by uh, the secular West, not all, I'm not, not, not generalizing, and they created it into the MMA and stuff like that. And it became, instead of becoming a beautiful art that is meant to refine this human being, it became an art that destroys this human being, an art that you beat this opponent. And that's why, from an Islamic perspective, if I look at the higher objectives that I, I mentioned, boxing is completely prohibited, professional boxing. And the like, why? Because you're beating somebody else and that's not allowed, right? And so equally when it comes to music. So there is music and there is music. And in the, in the case of the Adhan, the words are set, don't change, but anything else can be evolved and can, 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 can take different shapes and forms provided it does not go against the fundamental uh, teachings of Islam. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lynn, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, this is wonderful to, to hear. It's, it, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. Um, a question I have is um, a family I, I know was telling me about how their five-year-old is learning to memorise the Quran. And I, I was puzzled by that, thinking, well, how does she understand it? Is, isn't it important to understand? And I just wondered, yeah, is that common to um, young children that, that age who wouldn't understand much? Um, is that when they start to learn or, or what? Yeah, thank you. Excellent yeah. question. Uh, Five-year-old is not a standard, but it is not, uh, it is not surprising or strange to find that they may begin learning at that age. Uh, even if they don't understand, because uh, in the Islamic tradition uh, accepts the idea that uh, when the mind and the heart are still at its peak purit purified form, when the mind and the heart, and indeed at that, the younger the age, the more pure the person is. Uh, uh, in Islam, there is a concept, I'll just type it down here, called fitrah. The fitra means the natural disposition upon which humans are born. And the Islamic tradition, based on the evidence that is derived from the Quran and Hadith, tells us that every newborn child, every, regardless of where they are born, is born with the, on the fitra, the pure natural disposition, or the natural disposition of purity and innocence. And this human being, when they are in this phase of purity and innocence, if we see them as a container, this is the best time for them to start learning and memorizing. And in the Islamic tradition, uh, for the last 1400 years, this tradition of starting the children, training them to start learning, not just to memorize, but slowly, slowly training them to fast a couple of hours here or half an hour there, to, tr to train them to start praying, although it's not compulsory for them yet till they become of age. But this training is to take the maximum advantage and opportunity of that state of purity and goodness. 
And so, yes, they can start memorizing, although it's not compulsory. We have to understand it's not an obligation. It is a, it is a, a, a choice that the parents may make to start training their child to memorize the Quran. And uh, then uh, the, the, the recommendation, of course, is that once they have memorized or what they have memorized is to try to understand it and learn it. Now, that doesn't happen always, I must admit. Many a times, Muslims end up memorizing the Quran. In fact, uh, you may find it surprising that most, most people who memorize the Quran by in its Arabic original form are not Arabs, right? They are Pakistanis or Chinese. Or is, that's fascinating. Though they may, they and, and some Muslims would say this is part of the miraculousness of the Quran, that if you're a Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, person who doesn't, really no Arabic, but dedicated yourself to memorize the Quran, and voila, you end up memorizing the Quran and can read it word for word, right, for the rest of your life. The recommendation, of course, is that memorization is not sufficient. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient, and that one must try to learn it. And this was the tradition in the Islamic civilization. That's why the concept of madrasa, which is seen as problematic in a Western context, madrasa seems as a primitive primary school level actually was a very high standard uh, schooling institution in the Islamic civilization that taught more than just memorization, but taught the understanding of the Quran, the sciences of the Quran, and many other things along with that. But again, it's not surprising to find Muslim families uh, starting with the children when they're young to memorize or to practice the faith at a young age. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, most, most welcome. One of the things is very important to be adaptable. And I have a sense that breakout rooms is not, if it's best to just keep going with this conversation. Does that feel okay to people? Lovely being able to present these questions and and hear your your um, your very generous responses, Mohammed. So I think we will continue with uh, with where we're going with that. Um, Barry has a question. So Barry, would you like to unmute yourself and speak? I muted you before because you were me. So I'm sorry, I hope you can unmute yourself. Yeah, right, thank you. Professor, could I ask a question about the concept of martyrdom within um, Islam? Absolutely. Uh, in your opening, address you mentioned that Islam has been I'd use the word demonized by particularly by the, the Western press and we hear a lot about you know people who die and who will indeed uh, enjoy eternal life if you I'm using my terms here not your religious terms in terms of the uh, in in the next life um having listened to what you've said is that idea of martyrdom and uh, a an idea which is is a western idea or, and or, and does it come from the um quran excellent question thank you very much for that yeah, the idea of martyrdom does come from the Quran and the, and the Hadith, or the, the primary and secondary sources of Islam. The word for martyrdom is shahada, which I have uh, written in the chat box. But what do we mean by martyrdom? You see, sometimes, you know, uh, words have meanings and meanings have implications. You would agree with me, right? So when you translate a for, a, a, an, an un-English word, let's not call it a foreign word, an un-English word. Let me give, and, and I'll come to the word shahada. If I was to ask you, translate the word for me, the, translate the word jihad for me into English. How is it often translated? Anyone? In English, uh, how? Holy, holy exactly, war. Yeah. precisely. Yeah. Right? So the minute you translated an Islamic terminology, Islamic Arabic terminology, word, jihad into holy war what have you done here you've imposed on it a certain connotation and a meaning that is perhaps accurate in your context but not my context 
it is perhaps accurate in your historical experience with wars, but not in my historical religious experience. What I can tell you straight away here is that the term holy war does not exist anywhere in the Quran or the Hadith. And if I was to reverse translate holy war into Arabic, I would have to say harb muqaddasa. Holy war, harb muqaddasa. This, these two words combined do not exist anywhere in the Quran or the entire Hadith literature. You can see the problem immediately. And so when we use the word jihad, thank you uh, for saying it means struggle, thank you. When we use the word jihad, therefore, yes, fundamentally it means struggle or striving. And it can manifest itself into so many forms, and some scholars uh, say it could manifest itself into at least 14 different forms, this idea of jihad. One of those is the, the military struggle or the struggle in the battlefield, or the jihad in the battlefield, which is known as qital, right? That the specific technical term for that is not jihad as such, but qital. I just written that there, fighting. The other aspects of jihad include things like, again, I'm referencing evidence from the hadith in this case, when a young man came to the prophet, peace be upon him, and he said, I want to go and fight in qital. I want to do jihad by fighting. So he said to him, is, are your parents alive or one of them alive? He said, yes, both are alive. He says, then go back home and serve them. That is your jihad. You see the context here. Go and serve your parents. That is, that is you, for you, your jihad is to serve your parents. One of the highest forms of jihad in Islamic discourse is the jihad of the nafs, the struggle against your own self, <laughs> as you can see why it's difficult. <laughs> so if I come back then to the word martyrdom, we have to understand how Muslims view it. And thank you for your question. So the word for martyrdom is shahada. Shahada means witnessing. It means witnessing. But if I was to use the word in English, martyrdom, then in Islam, we don't understand martyrdom to be only those who genuinely and sincerely die in the battlefield and underline genuinely and sincerely. Because a, a fundamental teaching in Islam is all actions depend on intentions. Innam al-A'malu, the, uh, the, the first hadith of any hadith book is this hadith. The, 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 this statement of the Prophet, all actions depend on intentions. So if a person is fighting, but the intention is foul, or the intention is simply to kill and maim and loot, etc. And if they were to die in the midst of a battlefield, they're not considered as martyrs. <laughs> from it. And they're, they're not going to get the glory of paradise, right? In fact, they, they will get the opposite of that. So one, level, one form of martyrdom is to die defending yourself, your family, or your homeland. That's one type of martyrdom, and that is valid. But when the Prophet was speaking to his companions, and they said to him, are martyrs those who only die in the battlefield? He said, then the martyrs of my community will be few. And then he went to elaborate. He says, a person who dies because of a natural disaster, a building collapses in them, is a martyr. A person who dies because of an internal illness is a martyr. A person who dies drowning is a martyr, and so forth. And so you can see the concept of martyrdom is quite broad in Islam. One form of that martyrdom is if you are genuinely defending your faith or your homeland, or your country, or your honor, or your people, without transgressing the limits that God has put onto you. And the limits, in, and this is why in, in, in the, the jihad of fighting is so, the rules behind jihad of fighting are so strict and stringent that it's not open for interpretation. 
And every Muslim scholar will tell you, and this is in the all the in all the books of Islamic law, that if in fighting, if a person is involved in warfare, then the following must be adhered to as best as possible. Sadly, in today's warfare, it's hard to, but it's no justification. One, do not kill the innocent. Do not kill women or children or elderly who are not there fighting you. And do not destroy synagogues or churches. Do not loot, do not rape, do not burn down infrastructure. Do not cut down trees unnecessarily. And therefore, if a person goes against those, then is they're not a martyr. And if they were to die, but having infringed or gone against those ethics of warfare, then they're not a martyr, right? So martyrdom is not an easy concept in Islam, and it's not easily attainable, especially in battlefield. <laughs> it might be easily attainable in a natural disaster than in a battlefield. <laughs> Thank you very um, much for that. Thank you. Thank pleasure. you, Barry. We have another question from Jacqueline that's in the chat, and I will just read that. My second question is related to Islamic law, specifically Sharia. How does Sharia view homosexuality, and is there a place for LGBTQ plus individuals to practice Islam yes. while staying true to principles, its excellent. principles? No, excellent question. So Islam views any intimate sexual relationship outside of marriage between a man and woman as unacceptable. And look, notice my definition, because this definition includes not just homosexuals, but also heterosexuals who are, who are fulfilling their sexual desire in the wrong way. So Islam, and this is based on the evidence from the Quran and the Hadith, any intimate it sexual relationship outside of marriage between man and woman is unacceptable. And that's an acceptable law. So therefore, not only is homosexuality is deemed unacceptable, but adultery and fornication between heterosexuals is unacceptable. Right? And so as so because people think that Islam is only focusing on homosexuals and says that that relationship is unacceptable. Well, no, Islam says not only is that relationship unacceptable, but also the relationship between, between man and woman outside of marriage is acceptable. Right, that's number one. Does the practice of adultery or fornication, homosexuality, take a person outside of the fold of Islam? And the answer is no. There are two separate issues. One is a person's belief in God and other practices. And this is a question that was addressed by scholars a long time ago. They asked, does a Muslim who believe in God and pray five times, yet they practice uh, homosexuality, nullify their prayer? Or you can replace homosexuality for fornication, adultery. Is the prayer of a Muslim who practices adultery and fornication or homosexuality nullified? And the scholars and the jurists responded by saying, no, they are two separate issues his belief or her belief in God and their practice of the prayer, ritual prayer, is one thing for which they will be rewarded. But the practice of adultery or fornication, homosexuality is another. And those are deemed, are seen as sins, and in fact, major sins. But they do not amount to disbelief. So a person, and as human beings, we're all full, full, full of shortcomings, it is quite likely that a person may be a Muslim, yet committing a major sin. As long as that major sin does not reach the level of, and I'll write it down here, shirk. Shirk is the exact opposite of Tawheed. If Tawheed is the belief in the oneness of Allah, shirk is the belief that Allah is more than one or Allah has associates, or to associate partners with God. Right, shirk nullifies all deeds. Right, and uh, until unless a person, of course, repents from shirk, then of course God is all is all merciful and He can receive them with open arms. So I hope that sort of answered that question, uh, and the same with LGBTQI. Uh, now, uh, from a purely Islamic uh, perspective, 
that is unacceptable in Islam because of evidence found in the Quran and the Hadith. But we have no right to issue a judgment about this person as to what will God do with them on the day of judgment. That's not our business, right? But we could say that the practice, these practices contravene the teachings of Islam, right? But they may not necessarily take a person out of the fold of Islam. I hope, I hope I'm sort of clear on that. Is that clear? Right. Okay, thank you. Karen has a question. Oh, Professor, I um, I understand from your comments that there's so there is so much um, complexity and underlying of meaning and so on in how we understand the practices of Islam, and I I get quite concerned with how so many countries in the world do have different interpretations of what is teaching. In other religions, we have like in the Catholic tradition, we have a pope and we have some sort of orthodoxy around what is actually real teaching. Is there any way in in, in Islam that um, like rogue states or where quite radical interpretations occur that can be called out as being not true to Islam? Oh, yes. Thank you for that question. Every Muslim nation would have, we don't have a Pope, as you know, and we don't have a centralized church, but every, uh, the, but the Muslim world broadly, they would have uh, uh, institutions, uh, governing institutions that would include some of the top leading scholars from all part of the world where they meet uh, at an interna international level twice, three, four times a year to discuss emerging issues where maybe there has been there is no answer to those issues in the in the text or the text has not alluded to them take for example cloning right and so these scholars would meet alongside experts in the actual field in this case science or medicine and collectively they would use the text and the context to come up with answers that's at a, at a global level at a more uh, national level, or, uh, you'll find every Muslim country will have a mufti. A mufti is uh, uh, the equivalent, or, or you could say a professor of law at the highest level, who is able to understand the text and give an opinion about it. But does is that opinion is not binding? That opinion is binding. Because it only becomes binding if it goes to, to the Supreme Court, the court, and the court makes it a, a law. Uh, and that's interesting because Islam does not want to leave the the uh, the uh, implementation of the law in the hands of one person, right? And that's why historically, uh, uh, one of the books I referenced there is called "The Impossible State" by Wael Hallaq. It's a fascinating read. Wael Hallaq is a non-Muslim scholar who has written about this idea between about the separation of powers in the judiciary and the executive which is commonly attributed to democracy, and rightly so, but Islamic, in Islamic civilization, that practice was almost always there. And that is the separation of powers, the executive and the judi judiciary, which included the scholars of the highest level. Uh, and their role was to interpret the law, but the ac application and the execution of that law, of course, is the state's, is the state prerogative. Now, the problem in Muslim majority nations today, uh, Karen, is that this independence of judiciary and the executive is no longer there. It used to be. And now if you take a country like Saudi Arabia, you do have a group of scholars of the top level who discuss issues and try to guide and teach their society about those issues. But sadly, because of the dependence of these scholars on the state, there has been a level of corruption to the extent that the interpretation of Islam has become politicized. You can see the problem with that. In fact, one of the biggest arguments of Muslim intellectuals is about the problem in Muslim majority nations today, and this, has, this is probably from the last 200 years only, of the, the lack of separation between the judiciary and the executive. In this case, the judiciary is the Islamic judiciary. 
And so you can see where the problems arise. Uh, in Saudi today, since the coming of MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, for your knowledge, in case you did not know, he has already imprisoned at least 700 top Muslim scholars in Saudi who were renowned scholars, but because they were outspoken and who did not want to succumb to his wishes. So in order to implement his grand plans, whatever they are, the first thing he did was imprison those 700 scholars who would have perhaps objected to his vision and kept around him those scholars who would simply say what he wants. And you can see the problems there. If you, case the, if you take the case of Afghanistan, which may you may have been thinking about that, the Taliban, for instance, the Taliban, uh, because the government is the Taliban, and they are interpreting the law as they go, and many a times some of these interpretations, other Muslim scholars outside of Afghanistan see highly problematic, such as the prohibition of girls going to school. And so what other Muslim scholars from other parts of the world try to do was actually to go to Afghanistan. Of course, you won't hear that in your six o'clock news. <laughs> and try to meet with the uh, scholars of Taliban and try to impress upon them that such interpretations go against the mainstream understanding and the longstanding historical practice of Islam. But when politics and religion mix in this case, it becomes the more volatile and the more problematic. So, uh, so in, a, in a sense, I hope I've answered your questions. Thank you. Yes. It's complex and very, it's not unlike other religions, is it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> A lot yeah. of that goes on. James, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, thanks, Kate. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Abdullah. I guess I was interested in just a, a personal question. We've had some more sort of broader um, questions. The concept of holiness is a concept of holiness in Islam and in the way that you engage with the world, is it mainly the personal relationship with God, with Allah, or is it holiness in the way that you um, practice your faith and the corporate relationships that you have? H-O-L-E, uh, H-O-L-Y, -H right, holy. And yeah. Holiness, yeah. Mm. And I've I've written it there. And the word for holy is Quddus. And here, this is, I mean, to answer your question, I need to understand from you what you mean by holy and holiness, right? <laughs> because we could be so, but uh, so if from from the Islamic tradition, the word holy is Quddus. And the only time that the word Quddus was used in the Quran is in reference to God. Al-Quddus, so one of God's attributes or names is Al-Quddus, the Holy. And the other time, interestingly, uh, it was used in the Quran, is, was in reference to the angel Gabriel. And it's a Ruh Al-Quddus, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, that is Gabriel. So we could speak of complete holiness, which only belongs to God. So what we could separate holiness as absolute holiness, and that only belongs to God. No one can have can be absolutely holy. We are humans and we are full of faults. Uh, the and and so we can have part of that holiness as humans. And this is where prophets and messengers come in and saintly people come in. And so we can access the holiness of God through his revelation and through worshiping him and through having that personal relationship with God. But also we can manifest that holiness in ourselves by practicing what God wants us to practice on a daily basis. And we can come in the presence of holy people who have relative holiness uh, because of their saintly acts and behavior, both men and women, and the Islamic tradition are full of them, right? So that's that's my understanding of holiness and how we see it. Mm. Uh, 
Thank you. My pleasure. I am aware of the time. There are still a couple more questions in the chat, but what, what I would like to do if it's, I'm, I'm just going to do it as permission, is to is to wrap this up. But if, um, Professor, are you willing to just stay on for another 10 minutes after we finish to, for anybody who would like to stay to, to hear those further questions? But I do want to draw the formal gathering to a close and um, we're going to finish with some appreciations and a blessing. And then um, we will, th we'll have a, a PS. We'll have a post uh, question for those who would like to stay. I know some of you still have a couple of questions and it's just been so rich and wonderful and it's been, yeah, really delightful. So um, just before we move to the thanks, we have recorded this session. I think we could probably turn it off now. Thanks, Neil. We've recorded this session and it will be available probably this week uh, on the on the website through the news in the news tab. We'll probably mention it and it probably will also be under our resources. I will send an email to everyone who is registered to let you know when that is available. So you can you can watch this um, as well, James. I will I hand over to you for the thanks. Yes, thanks very much, Kate and uh, Professor Abdullah. On behalf of Eramos and behalf of everyone here today, I want to express our sincere thanks for this deeply insightful and generous presentation and discussion. Um, it was such a, a rich discussion, and I know. Many of us will um, take away the insights that you've shared, the way that you were so generous in addressing misconceptions and simplifications, and also um, exploring that idea of sacredness in, in the world around us. Um, so there's so much for us to, uh, to think on and to reflect on. And um, so thank you. And, and I also think that today is a, is a reminder of the value and the beauty of having open-hearted conversations, um, especially at the end of a week where there's been political upheaval in the world, where there's been so many voices of rancor and division and abuse, um, and they've been so loud. I think it's so important to have these conversations that build understanding and build connection and I know, Professor Abdullah, that you generously share your time and your knowledge and your wisdom with so many other groups. Um, I listened to a podcast that you did with the Safi Bros recently, and um, that was a fabulous discussion and lovely insights about family and, and upbringing in Australia. And so you give so much to people across Australia, and it's quite inspiring. And I just want to thank you for the time that you've shared with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much.